Gandhiji will find himself permanently in stone, very close to the place he occupied transiently in flesh and blood on his first night in London more than 125 years ago. Gandhiji struggled to break Britain's imperial hold over India and to force the world's oldest democracy to create the world's largest one, a stuff of history and legend. But even as he waged this struggle, he admired Britain, valued many of the things that it stood for, and cherished his friendship with scores of Britons. During the Battle of Britain, he was moved to tears at the thought that Westminster Abbey might be bombarded. So great was his regard for British values that he would condemn many unfair and unjust practices as being un-British. Today, India and Britain have come a long way since the parting at the midnight hour of 1947. Historical legacies form the ties that bind our two countries. Language, the enlightened values of democracy, free speech, pluralism, religious freedom, rule of law, institutions such as merit-based civil service, civilian-controlled army, independent judiciary, and a very vibrant press. These bequests have had a lasting effect on us. Mature nations transcend bitterness and acrimony. In Parliament Square, there is also a statue of Sir Winston Churchill, arguably the man who opposed Gandhi most resolutely. Some would detect an irony in the great Prime Minister sharing a public space with a man he once described as a half-naked fakir. Maybe there is an irony, but even Churchill would have acknowledged that the resolve, determination, and even cunning he showed in standing up to the mighty military machine that threatened the very existence of a proud and free people was replicated by Gandhiji in a seeming unequal battle against the world's mightiest empire. What will link Churchill and Gandhi together is their strength of character. But it's a greater tribute to Britain to recognize Gandhiji's contribution and choose to place the seditious half-naked fakir next to his one-time nemesis Churchill. And of course, next to the man that Gandhiji inspired, Nelson Mandela. For this gracious act, Mr. Prime Minister, my government and all of India are deeply thankful to the tireless work of the Gandhi Statue Memorial Trust, including its chairman, Lord Meghna Desai, to the prodigious talent of sculpture, Philip Jackson, and above all, the capacious Gandhi-like spirit of the British government and its people. An extract from Non-Violent Way to World Peace by Mahatma Gandhi. Perhaps never before has there been so much speculation about the future as there is today. Will our world always be one of violence? Will there always be poverty, starvation, misery? Will we have a firmer and wild belief in religion? Or will the world be godless? If there is to be a great change in society, how will that change be wrought? By war or revolution? Or will it come peacefully? Different men give different answers to these questions. Each man drawing the plan of tomorrow's world as he hopes and wishes it to be. I answer not only out of belief, but out of conviction. The world of tomorrow must be, will be, a society based on non-violence. That is the first law. Out of that, all other blessings will follow. It may seem a distant goal, an impractical utopia, but it is not in the least unobtainable, since it can work for here and now. An individual can adopt the way of life of the future, the non-violent way, without having to wait for others to do so. And if an individual can do it, cannot whole groups of individuals, whole 
global nations, men often hesitate to make a beginning because they feel that the objective cannot be achieved in its entirety. This attitude of mind is precisely our greatest obstacle to progress, an obstacle that each man, if he only wills it, can clear it. Thank you. Gandhi in this famous square, we are giving him an eternal home in our country. The man who turned the politically unimaginable into the politically inevitable, whose work in South Africa paved the way for Mandela. A man whose doctrine of Sati Grahara became the inspiration for the civil rights movement across the world. This inspirational man worked out who he was and what he stood for right here in Britain. It was in London that as a young man that Gandhi first learned to petition, to draft letters, to make speeches. It was here where he was treated equally by his colleagues at the Inner Temple that the foundations were laid for his battles against segregation and discrimination. And even years later, when he was striving for Indian independence, his respect for the people of this country shone through. If Gandhi could have lived anywhere in the world outside India, he said it would have been here in London. We should be proud of that, and we should be proud of him. This statue celebrates the incredibly special friendship between the world's oldest democracy and its largest. I think of the one and a half million Indians who do so much to make Britain the country it is today. I think of the growing trade between our nations. But I also think of the way we have both pursued Gandhi's vision of different faiths living together in harmony. We are both proud to be multiracial, multi-ethnic democracies. And we will always stand together against those who would seek to destroy the societies that we have built. Gandhi said, you must not lose faith in humanity. Humanity is like an ocean. If a few drops of the ocean are dirty, the ocean does not become dirty. Britain and India stand together for humanity. He looked rather like this 68 years ago to his assassin. He looked straight into his eyes quite exactly like this. Gandhi was walking, of course, not standing, as he walked straight into those three bullets. He embraced those darts, he did with the might of his pain for others, with the depth of his faith in God, he hugged them. He had fought for years to prevent the division of India along the lines of religion. But with that division becoming a fact, he fasted for peace amongst the two main peoples of India, Hindus and Muslims, and for trust between the newly independent India and newborn Pakistan, which included what is now Bangladesh. Had he lived, he would have asked to have the man who shot at him 
freed. He had, after all, been greatly influenced by Jesus the Christ. Gandhi had just begun to dream to work for a new India that may or may not be rich, that may or may not be powerful, but which will be fair and just to its own poor and to the immiserated everywhere. He believed in learning from truth and from the many truths of India, the truths that make India great and the truths that have kept her small. Not running away from those truths, not papering them over or trying to prettify them. For peace and its offspring happiness can come only by acknowledging what is real. He said, the way of peace is the way to truth. Gandhi scorched by his love and he healed by his fire. We need him in India today more than we ever have. He said there was so much he had left unfinished that he would like to be reborn. But he would not want us in India to look for the reborn Gandhi. Gandhi was no loser. That would be a loser's way of doing things. And India is no loser. India finds herself from the debris of her mistakes and the ruins of her aspirations. Whenever she has been considered lost, India has been found by an astonished world and a relieved world to be the mother of her greatest son, Gautama the Buddha, in whom composure stood above turbulence. And to the genius of her immensely wise and even sagacious people of all faiths and the other great faith, faith in one's own striving hands. I have used she for India with deliberation, for that she, the woman in India, worshipped in concept, but neglected, exploited, and abused in reality so often is the one of the scorching truths of India. The fact that London, the capital of the then imperial power, he disengaged India from, raises a statue for him, even as India has some people contemplate a temple for his assassin, shows that Gandhi's work for freedom of belief and expression succeeds in the most unbelievable ways. You were not infallible, Mohandas Gandhi. You erred often, as your wife Kasturba knew more than any other person. But you owned your errors and tried always to be better than your best. Bronzed and hearkening here, in what once was your opposite ground, you will give heart to those who want a world that does not fear the bully. The bell chimes for that. The world that does not fear the bully, does not fear the bomb or the blatant lie. You will show us too, Mohandas Gandhi, that money cannot buy, nor power ever suborn the truth. On behalf of your family, which means not just your biological descendants alone, for you did not elevate family descent, but all those anywhere who experience the tyranny of bigotry and exploitation and try to resist it. I felicitate Great Britain and Her Majesty's government for creating space for this Gandhi statue on this great square. That large family celebrates the fact of his statue taking its place right beside that of his political descendant, Nelson Mandela. How many countries celebrate the life work of a man who opposed it with vehemence for more than three decades? Not many, but Britain does. And Britain celebrates Gandhi today because while oppose it, he did.
He opposed it in a cause that Britain now sees was just and in a way the world now sees was fair.